Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ASL lecture series. And here on screen, you can see our presenter for this evening. The ASL lecture series likes to provide professional communication development to be able to see professional ASL and also to be exposed to various parts of the culture. We hope that our audiences are inspired to learn more about ASL and deaf culture through these experiences that our presenters share with you. We also know that there is diversity in ASL between different regions and dialects. This lecture series provides more formal ASL, which is a chance for you as an audience member to see how ASL is used in more formal and academic settings, and we welcome you to this event. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Joseph Hill. I am an associate professor here at RIT, and I'm in the Department of ASL slash Interpreter Education at the College of NTID. I also serve as an assistant dean for the NTID faculty recruitment and retention position. I've been here for about six years, and I've really enjoyed my tenure here. I would like to describe the background that I'm in. I have blue curtains behind me. I have black hair parted to the side, brown skin, a beard and mustache. I have a button down blue shirt opened at the top. And on top of that, I have a gray vest. I would now like to introduce our presenter for the evening. Corian Thomas, who goes by Coco. Coco was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. He identifies as Black Deafblind. He got his bachelor's degree in social work, specifically for HIV education and also received his master's degree in public administration from Gallaudet University. He got another master's in counseling from the University of Northern Texas. He has been an advocate for the deafblind community for 20 years. And I'm sure that you would rather see him present rather than me. And so I would like to hand this evening over to Coco. Good evening, everyone. My name is Coco. I would like to thank Jeannie Beam and Dr. Hill for welcoming me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I value access and I value equity, whether that's for hearing, deaf, or deafblind participants, it is very important to me that everyone has access via sign, via speech, via captions, or via protactile ASL. I today am working with a protactile ASL interpreter, and I really value that. First, I would like to describe my appearance. I am a black deafblind man. I have a beard, I'm bald, and I'm wearing a blue shirt and have a blue background. In deafblind culture, communication is so appreciated, and it's always important to identify yourself with your name before you comment or before <laughs> you have a question. Um, and that's true for my interpreters who I'm working with tonight as well. I would like to expand more on my biography. I was born in Dallas, Texas. I was actually born hearing. And for two years, I became seriously ill and experienced tinnitus and a fever. I remember in those last 
two years of being sick, just being so bothered by my tinnitus. And my family talks about that as well, because I couldn't remember everything that had happened. I do remember going to the hospital at that time and my parents and family really trying to figure out what was going on. And at the end of that two year period, I became deaf. I then went to an oral school, which was not successful for me. The teachers would often actually slap my mouth. I remember a friend and I lived in the same apartment, but they excelled at that oral school and I didn't. So I often encountered a lot of punishment and correction there. I then moved into another community and I did experience oral education and also signed exact English, but was able to excel in that environment, especially with being able to have access to sign even though assigned exact English. My exposure to ASL came later. Growing up, I did not know that I actually had a visual problem. Occasionally there would be anomalies um, that I didn't notice and my family thought that that could be corrected through glasses. Um, and so I grew up that way. I learned how to drive and I kept having some kind of barriers and a couple close calls. And so my family said, you know what? No more driving at night, but you can still drive during the daytime if it's the night don't drive. So I started driving only in the daytime, making sure I got home before it was too dark, etc. As time went on, my best friend, his name's Chad, we had a lot of times the same professors, the same teachers, and they kept noticing things as well. And I remember noticing for myself a lot of similar structures and patterns happening where people were always trying to get my attention. And as long as, it, if it wasn't in my line of sight, I wasn't able to see that people were trying to get my attention. And so one of my teachers said, you really need to get a more in-depth eye exam. And so I went to the ophthalmologist, had that appointment and oh my goodness, me. They had a two-hour assessment. There was dilation. There was all kinds of things. And they did all of these tests to really examine my entire eye and all of the various things that could, could be happening. Could I see from left to right? Could I see up and down, etc. After that two-hour exam, I was diagnosed with Usher syndrome. And at that time, I didn't know what Usher syndrome was. And to really give a basic explanation of it, the doctor simply said, you are blind. And for me at that time, to hear that I was blind was a, a huge blow. And I remember the time just after I had been diagnosed, I was shocked. Um, I did a lot of crying during that time. My friends were very supportive, but they didn't know necessarily much about Usher syndrome as well. And so my family, my friends got together and really did some research um, about what that was. And it was really hard for me to sleep at that time. And I was afraid um, because I thought if I ever fell asleep, I would wake up and not be able to see light again. So I would sleep would wake up, sleep would wake up, and realized at that time that I wasn't completely blind yet. I wasn't waking up and not able to see anything. At that time when I did become deaf blind, it was definitely a culture shock and was overwhelming. Although I was still able to keep my grades up at that time, which was good. I didn't go, um, I actually ended up le leaving Gallaudet and came back in 1998. Um, and at that time, I was noticing changes in my vision again, but I decided to still go back to um, Gallaudet in 1998. And I still had some good friends there um, who also 
were showing symptoms of Usher syndrome, but I opted not to say anything. Um, many people at that time actually thought I was a snob because I couldn't see them, <laughs> but it really was because I had Usher syndrome. But long story short, my eyes did change over years and years. And rather now than saying I have Usher syndrome, I now identify as deaf blind. During my first master's degree, I did a lot more um, research to help myself be more aware of what the deaf blind culture looked like and also what um, visual culture was like. And Usher syndrome really falls under blindness, but I just educated myself and was able then to grow my pride as a deaf blind person and my self-esteem. I want to talk about some various um, communication models. I did grow up in oral education and with speech. My family is so dear to me. And I really consider them to be my first teachers. And really many of the teachers that I've had throughout the years were gentle and who were wonderful. And they helped teach me speech during that time. And I did not suffer any abuse from them in any way. Um, but yes, I did grow up learning oral spoken English. I now only use my voice with my family. There are very specific hearing people who I might have a certain level of comfort with. Um, if a situation comes up that there is a hearing person who struggles with sign, I will then sometimes make clarifications with my voice. But I, at this point, only use my speech as needed, though I grew up with that. And my family doesn't, thankfully, my family has not ever forced me to speak. But for me, I want to make sure that I keep communication open with my family. And since um, my family uses various methods of communication, they both speak, they sign somewhat, um, they also gesture. Um, and before actually I lost my vision, I was actually a very skilled lip reader. Um, that Those are different ways that I am able to communicate with them. It's so interesting because I actually can interpret for my deaf friends who visit my family at this point, even though I have now lost my sight and have significant Usher syndrome, which is quite interesting. Aside from learning speech, I also learned signed exact English. So I am going to the store. She does not, et cetera. Lots of initialization. Um, he, it, them, they, ha have, has, all of those are examples of using signed exact English, which I learned um, in succession with speech. Over time, I then adopted ASL, and that was really in my high school years. Um, it was a short time in which I did that. I did have a hearing teacher who actually taught ASL to the hearing students, and he asked me if I would be an ASL tutor. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to. <laughs> and he introduced me as his ASL assistant. But at that time, I actually was really um, having a hard time code switching between ASL and English. And it was dizzying, a dizzying experience. After high school, I then entered Gallaudet. Um, and I experienced ASL there. But really, in my experience, there are lots of different ASLs. There are some people who sign C, they're signed PSC. My point is that my experience of sign language has been quite diverse um, and I'm quite flexible with how I decide to communicate with people. Another issue that happened is that at the time um, that my vision was going, tactile ASL was not something that I engaged much with. But as my sight continued to decline, it was something that I really had to learn. 
So I learned tactile ASL in Seattle, Washington during the time that I worked there at a deafblind service center and really was able to immerse myself in that, meet several people who use tactile ASL and really be able to learn that skill. I then learned protactile ASL, so PTASL. And I want to make sure that I explain clearly the differences between tactile ASL and protactile ASL. All of us know that ASL is a language here in America, but some states, depending on where you were raised, so my home state of Texas, has actually a very strong oral and signed exact English education community. There are many layers to that. But my point in that American Sign Language um, is used in most states and most areas around the US. So tactile, or ASL I should say, has five parameters. Tactile ASL then adds another, in a sense, parameter or factor of hand-to-hand -hand contact. Protactile ASL, on the other hand, you may be, you might notice that it's very close to tactile ASL. But protactile ASL has seven parameters. So I just want to compare protactile ASL and ASL for now. We don't have to go too much in depth, but I do want to make sure this explanation is clear. So ASL has air space, right? So for example, pointing or indexing. Tactile ASL, um, you would be holding on to the person's finger and following where they're pointing, but it's still confusing. And for me, as a person who still has some residual sight left, I would be able to maybe follow that, but it's still confusing. Now for protactile ASL, rather than putting that space in the air, it becomes actual tactile space on my body. So one example of this is a subgroup of contact space, which is called reference space, which is called point to point. So like if it's on myself, I go from point A to point B. So if you're role shifting, like for example, if different people are speaking, you might indicate that on different parts of your body rather than just shifting in space. There's another layer to that as well, because there's tactile ASL and then there's haptics. And those two things were combined to be part of protactile ASL. So I have met many members of deafblind communication of deafblind individuals who use communication and I recognize it as a language, though I wasn't there to develop it at the time with protactile ASL. But if you look at the deafblind blind communities, most of them use ASL along with um, protactile habits. I'm right now signing to you ASL, but if I sign protactile ASL, the interpreter who's looking on the screen might not understand me. So I try to sign ASL in this. So protactile ASL usually um, should be included in interpreting programs because right now not many interpreters might be familiar with that. But I wanna make sure that that description of protactile ASL is clear, correct? I wanna make sure the interpreter's caught up. Space and boundaries is another area that I want to talk about briefly. And that's one of the protactile principles of reciprocity, which I really like. So in investigating this, it seems that um, many languages do have, but protactile really makes a value of, which is exchanging that information. This is not about critique. 
reciprocity theory is a very positive approach to communication. So spaces and boundaries, in my experience, and then looking back, have been a huge part of my communication. And I have experienced um, much oppression in my life. Um, looking back on my experience as a deafblind person and seeing those points at which I felt barriers to expressing myself, I really had to look back and think about my close friends who were there during all those times that I knew they were supportive of me and what that looked like. And that wasn't always true of all the members of the communities I was part of. When I think about working with interpreters or in working with other people, it's important to have that reciprocity and not have a one-way communication. I think it's important also not to label others. I want to be able to communicate who I am to you. And I think an important thing is to educate, educate and advocate and make sure that we have clear information um, to give to others. Deaf blindness is not a disability. For example, that's a, um, that's a stereotype that we need to avoid. Um, another stereotype might be that deaf blindness is a, um, mental health issue since historically deaf blind individuals were placed in institutions um, by hearing individuals rather than realizing that deaf blindness has a language and is not a mental health issue even though meant even though deaf blind individuals can have mental illnesses the biggest barrier to deaf blind individuals is their access to communication to communication I'm often asked if I have a degree, which I do. And many people are shocked to hear that because they often associate deaf blindness with mental health issues, et cetera. It's important for us to think about those space and boundaries. Because when I realize there are not many deaf, black, and blind individuals who have come out. It's important to think about fighting for access and advocacy in those areas. It's important not to judge and I want to make sure that people know that I value diversity and equity. And I look out and a lot of times there are white deaf individuals who have excelled or white deaf blind individuals who have excelled. And I look out and say, where are our black deaf blind individuals who are excelling out in the world? And oftentimes those black deaf blind individuals are afraid to come forward with um, maybe blindness or other things because they're worried about being stigmatized as having mental health issues. And so it's so important for us to visibly expose and educate others in those issues so that we're able to see more people of color in the deafblind communities more visibly. So space and boundaries if we really want to exchange and share information, it's not uh, anyone's place to judge or critique that process. It's not. We can allow the person to self-assess and to make those decisions for themselves.
I own my words. I look back and I can reflect um, as a person that has Usher syndrome and what has been my part in this. So Coco can see or Coco can do this. That's where maybe more education is needed. When I came out as a deafblind person, my perspective really changed. And it was important to educate and to exchange information related to my journey as well. So if I want to exchange information with you, for example, if I feel, mm, let me make a suggestion or let me just stop. I will just stop there. If I'm sharing information and it's related to someone's story, which is not my own personal story, let's let's give an example here. If we are exchanging information and my interpreter is sharing with me something that is confidential. It's not my place to share that. If I'm curious about something, I need to go ahead and assert myself and ask the question. Ask that person directly, not go to someone else and ask about this person. So that's one example. So when we're talking about access and we're talking about friends and people who know an individual or speaking in general, and we're thinking about a deaf blind person and their access, this is not a place where I can say, yes, I know about this. I know what their access needs are. So I can let them know and I can receive this information and maybe I'm not sure or I'm confused. The interpreter should not answer for me as a deafblind person. The deafblind person should give that information for themselves and that's their autonomy because the deafblind person knows other people don't know for them. That's information, that's information as well. That relates to, in, in English, we use the word, interpreter missed that word. Hearing deaf or deaf blind. We want to have information equity here. And it is very common to notice when someone says what, or asks what a deaf blind person needs, and then the answer is responded for the deaf blind person instead of receiving the answer directly from the deaf blind person about what their needs are. So one of my favorite topics here, and that's very dear to my heart, is culture. Culture and having access to our culture uh, with our families, for example, it doesn't matter, but the point is to respect culture. So as a deafblind person who grew up learning speech, I grew up using C, I learned ASL and that was a very rich experience of learning to sign ASL, even though I'm deafblind. And there are a variety of deafblind and hard of hearing people who speak and who don't speak. And sometimes we think, you know, about deafblind people and, and having hard of hearing abilities or having different uh, levels of vision. Oh. And that really opens our awareness that there's a diverse 
of backgrounds and experiences within the deafblind community. So thinking about mouth movements, for example, sometimes I do make specific mouth movements, but I'm not making speech sounds. Other times I might sign with minimal mouth morphine. Sometimes I'm emotional, I'm happy, and I, I express uh, myself differently using specific mouth morphemes or not. So a lot of people have at least about uh, deaf blindness and the and So thinking about uh, gender, thinking about trans identities and LGBTQ communities, we just have to respect them as diverse deafblind people as well who have a unique culture. Thank you so much. And now it appears it's time for us to wrap up our event. We want to thank you again for your time for sharing your knowledge and your experiences with us. Thank you.